My guests today are Jane Gurr and Ed Kusarak, and I should say filmmakers because that's what you both are, and documentarians to be even more exact. Yeah, thank uh, you, Monique. Thanks for having us. Tell me about your latest documentary, Lunch at the Rito. What is it about? Well, Lunch at the Rito is a 25 minute film that we shot 20 years ago in 2002. We were making a larger film called Counterculture, which was going to tell the stories of disappearing lunch counters in the Ottawa area. And we had selected three and a small team of us were assigned to work on the Rideau Bakery lunch counter story. And um, from that, we got engaged in a bigger project involving uh, telling the story of the Rideau Bakery and the Cartish family who have been running the bakery since 19, had been running the bakery since 1930. We, we completed a, a really good edit of the film and um, it unfortunately sat on a shelf for 20 years uh, until last fall when Ed had the great idea to uh, bring it out of the shadows. We, um, we took a look at it and felt that it was a, a still a strong story, uh, but it just needed to be updated. So. We added a new title and updated the story and submitted the project to, to the um, uh, Ottawa Canadian Film Festival. And the film is a look back at the Rideau Bakery lunch counter. It was a favorite place of many people. Uh, it served kosher food. It had a warmth and a vibrancy and a community around it that had developed over many years. So the film goes to the, to the lunch counter. We see many of the characters who made it such a wonderful place. And we hear from the, the Cartish family about its significance uh, to them, uh, to the community and what its future might be. Why did you feel this film needed to be resurrected given that it had sat on the shelf for 20 years? It all started because I had watched a, a documentary called The Automat. And The Automat was a, 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 a series of a, a chain food restaurants based primarily in New York City and, and Philadelphia that used to have vending machines and little windows. Uh, and you could see the food behind the windows and you put your nickel in or your two nickels and you get a fresh sandwich or a, 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 a coffee or a pie. And it was... Um, a way of life and it was very popular in all walks of life from the very poor to the very rich and it, and everyone talked to each other and it was very popular and I just remember this film that sat around on a hard drive for 20 years. I said it's kind of the same thing fresh food affordable food where people talk they enjoyed it it was a way of life that disappeared we, and we don't have that kind of life anymore. We don't have these kind of places where you could chat with someone you never knew across, you know, over a sandwich. So I looked at it and I said, oh my God, they, Jane did a really great job on this video. Like we got to do something with it. So I called her up and we got the ball rolling. When you resurrected this documentary, the Rito Bakery had already closed its doors. Exactly. And that's what made it even more um, um, important to tell this story. And I want to add something here. Um, this is a couple of years ago. I was at a workshop with a commissioning editor, former commissioning editor with TV Ontario. And he said something to me that always stayed with me. He says, we as documentary filmmakers, one of our responsibilities is to document our way of life so the future generations can have time capsules of what life was, uh, was like and how they can learn from it and grow. While I was preparing for the interview today, I came across some information that this particular project had started while you were attending SIFT, the Summer Institute of Film and Television. It was indeed, and it was a wonderful um, source for many of us who were wanting to get involved with filmmaking to take relatively inexpensive week-long week courses in uh, directing, screenwriting, um, documentary, lighting, et cetera, um, to, to, you know, to learn new skills and meet people in the Ottawa area who were also interested in filmmaking. It was really a shame when it closed. Ed, what do you think 
it was about the Rideau Bakery and the lunch counter that made it so special. Oh boy, that's, um, uh, let me think about that for a minute. Um, I think what made it special is that you had this, um, this relationship you could develop with the person sitting beside you or with the uh, with in, in our case the person who was making the food and serving it gloria and that kind of interaction that was going by and you could come there every day and and you know the baked goods if you grab you went across the aisle there and grab grab some donuts or some uh, some munchies it was fresh it was made that day and it's really hard to find that kind of ambiance and, and I guess for the com Jewish community, it was even more important because it was kosher. It was probably the only kosher restaurant uh, food place anywhere in Ottawa, let alone anywhere else for the longest time. And what I understand from the Kardash family, it never really made a lot of money, but they kept it going as a social place and as a place for Jewish communities to come out and ha have a place to eat. Okay. And as we discover in the film, when you watch it, um, the lunch counter had a surprisingly profound uh, meaning for for some people. Our film, in our film, you you meet Brenda Firestone, who whose family um, were survivors of the Holocaust, and who made the choice, uh, perhaps in 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 an attempt to protect their children, uh, to really not raise their kids with the Jewish faith. And so for Brenda as an adult, going to the Rideau Bakery became a way for her to connect to her Jewish heritage and to meet other people from the community and just be uh, in a place that her mother used to take her to. Um, and, and that was you know, a, a warm and welcoming place, but in, in her adult years, uh, a place to find, to explore her, her identity as a Jew. Did you ever eat lunch at the Rideau Bakery? I live in Sandy Hill and had been a patron of the Rideau Bakery for a long time before I started working on this project. I used to love to go and sit at the lunch counter, sometimes with my young kids, um, to have a tuna fish sandwich on rye. That was my favorite sandwich. And it was just a warm and welcoming place with the little round stools and the, and the counter. And you know a friendly face who you got to know behind the counter, Gloria, who you also meet in the film. Um, I used to, I have an office down in the Byward Market, and I used to go over there because I used to have a, an addiction for sweets. So I go buy their chocolate donuts and then sit across on the counter side and have my coffee with my chocolate donut. So it was a special treat, and sometimes those donuts were all gone, and that. So it was tough. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the rye bread, Jane. I believe that was one of the things that the bakery was famous for. Rito Bakery rye bread has a, a very, a very big reputation. It's known, I would say, worldwide. Really, I mean, we heard stories when we were filming about people who would come from New York City, from Europe, somebody even from Australia, I think. Um, and when they were in Ottawa, would buy Rito Bakery rye bread and take it home with them. An interesting anecdote about the rye bread is that it was based on a recipe that was uh, developed by the great grandmother of the, 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 the last Kardash family generation uh, to run the bakery up until uh, 2019, David and Louis Kardash and their sister Debbie Baylin. So it was a very old recipe uh, by their great grandmother uh, Rivka, who had um, started a bakery in in Ukraine, not too far from Kiev, in a town called Kamenets Podolsk, uh, as a way of raising, uh, as a way of, of supporting her family financially, because her husband was a Hebrew scholar. One of the things that I find very interesting about this film is that the footage was recorded in 2002 that's quite a while ago and there are parts in the documentary where you talk about the future of the bakery and there seems to be this feeling that it would be wonderful if the bakery could continue but also an understanding that sometimes things change and that 
there is a possibility that the bakery uh, may close. What was the conversation like when you had to contact the family ab about this documentary, given that the bakery had closed? I think that the Kardish family, as you mentioned, were prepared mentally that they might not be able to continue um, with the bakery being part of the family. And um, they had had, a, you know, an amazing run with four generations, which is really remarkable in Canadian small business for four generations of a family to be involved in, in the family business. But I think they were thrilled when they learned that we had finished the film. Certainly, they're, they're keen to see it. There's several members of the family who are coming out to see it on Thursday at the, uh, at the Bytown. As Lewis says at the end, you know, at a certain point, you ask yourself, I wonder whatever happened to that, that place. And that's just the way it goes. What Lewis says that the film, in some ways, was so predicting the future way beyond anyone's imagination when that film was made. Because the bakery closed, what, is, what was it, uh, in 215, right, Jane? 219. Um, and so when Lewis says that at, at, the, at the end of the film, it was like, for me, it just blew my mind away. He was talking about something that wasn't going to happen for 20 years, right? Almost 20 years, right? So it, it, it was one of those, what they call a gem in the film, you know? What drew me to this film was the fact that it was a documentary made by local documentary filmmakers about a local cultural institution. And I think that's really important for us to be able to capture the places that are important to us in real time and, and to share that with the community. Ed and, and Jane, can you maybe talk a little bit more about what's going on in the world of documentary filmmaking in Ottawa? As far as I know, there's not much happening. Um, the Ottawa is, is, is a place where more fictional uh, uh, films are made, the Christmas movies. Um, Digi60 has that challenge every year, which is a terrific um, uh, initiative of young filmmakers making their seven minute film, but th there's no support for, for documentaries anymore. So there's very few documentaries made in Ottawa and even the ones that are made, even if they're successful and they get a bit of recognition and maybe a bit of, you know, maybe they get played on CBC or maybe they get played at a festival. There's, there, it's hard to make a living making a documentary in Ottawa. So anyone who makes their first film and, and it's a hit can't stay doing that and they move on to something else. So it, it, it's, it's not a documentary community here. Well, you know, I had great hopes um, back in 2002 when I did that SIFT course, the Summer Institute of Film and Television, that, you know, I'd have a career in documentary and I have been involved in quite a few projects and Ed and I have been working together for years, but you know, Ottawa is just like many other places in Canada. It is very hard to raise financing to make documentaries and the terrain for that has gotten worse, not better over the years. You know, there are plenty of people who are, you know, attempting to work on their own passion projects. And I would, I would describe this one as, as a, you know, a labor of love. It's it's something that we have just done um, on our own. Um, so there are plenty of people who are doing that. But in terms of, you know, really being able to build a company or build a portfolio and and do it while making a living, that is that is very difficult to do. There aren't a lot of people who are doing that. Do you think there are many stories about Ottawa that are going untold? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the Rideau Bakery is, is one of many incredible things that we have in Ottawa, many incredible communities and stories. I mean, they're just, it's limitless what, what we could be uh, uh, making films about in our city. Um, but, but again, um, it, it's a tough industry, very tough industry to work in. You know, I, I can't give you a, a concrete example at the moment, but yes, there are. I mean, I, I volunteer and write articles for my community newspaper, The Oscar. And 
you know, almost every second issue, I have a, a great story to tell about something that someone in my community is, is doing here in Old Ottawa South. Many of those stories I write could easily be short 10 minute, 20 minute documentaries. So what do we do to, to correct that? Can we correct that? Is there something we can do? That, that's a tough one because um, we need some new champions. We need some people who, um, you know, are visionary, who maybe, there used to be a fund for documentaries, um, um, but we don't have that uh, where, you know, in Ottawa, we could support young filmmakers making their first documentary with like a couple of thousand dollars or something, some sort of initiative to start this. But we need some leaders who want to do that to continue telling stories of Ottawa. I'm not sure I'm the person to do it anymore at my age. So I don't know what the solution is. I wish I did. I mean, you know, there there are a few funds that people can ac access financing from. the The city of Ottawa has a a small uh, uh, art arts grant. Uh, that that people can apply for the the Canada Council is in Ottawa and uh, there you know there there's funding there and and I mean we do have some broadcasters and some filmmakers in Ottawa have accessed for example uh, CBC Community Stories funding and have had their films on CBC but um, it it's in terms of for example feature length documentaries they're really expensive to make. And it is, um, it is so challenging to, to get licensing fees and leverage license fees from, from various broadcasters and access uh, foundation money and crowdsourcing. Um, all of those things are hugely labor intensive. And um, so I, I don't know what the solution is. Um, I'm gonna keep working on films <laughs> just because I, I love the medium and I love the challenge and I love the stories. Um, I'm at a stage in my life where I can I can do that uh, with with other colleagues like Ed and and others. Um, and uh, you know I can I can just uh, keep <laughs> sort of um, struggling along and 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 trying to make it happen. But um, yeah, I I don't know what the solution is to be honest. I I don't have any big ideas. Um, I think one possible champion for this is actually the Ottawa Canadian Film Festival. If we can continue to grow this festival and get more people to come and if they can get more sponsors and more supporters, it will draw the draw people here to make documentaries and if they could, their films could be launched at this festival, it's going to help us all. So bravo. Yeah, that's a good that point. Festival. It seems like Sorry, we're all I... on the same page. <laughs> Because I was thinking the very exact same thing, Ed. Sorry, Jane, uh, you were going to say. Well, we we should we should say, Monique, just how very thrilled we were to have our film be part of the Ottawa Canadian Film Festival. It's a wonderful festival with great organizers who are truly committed to um, to filmmaking and to supporting uh, Canadian filmmakers in particular. So uh, it's a wonderful home for our film, and we're we're really really excited that um, it's going to be seen on Thursday night. And finally, before we end off this conversation, is there anything you'd like to add? Oh, I'd like to jump in on this. It's a very interesting point. When this film was made, this was in the old format, what they used to call the four by three, a four by three um, uh, uh, aspect ratio with mini DV tapes. And what was interesting was technology was changing back then. So Jane and her colleagues, uh, Kent, the co-director, could afford to buy himself a camera for a couple of thousand dollars. The Sony PD-150 camera came out. So that when they made, Jane, uh, Noah, and, and Kent made that film, there were three people only to make that all on their own. And it was affordable because they could afford to buy the equipment. They didn't have to hire a cameraman with his $50,000 camera and pay him $1,000 a day. So technology was changing. The problem that we had, which is very interesting, uh, it was as the technology was changing to HD, for us to resurrect that film and that old technology, 
and trying to um, export it in the old version of Final Cut 20 years ago was a challenge. So how much has changed since then? That it's actually more, we can actually make these films much more affordable now if, if people are interested in doing it. What I would say, Monique, is um, Ed and I are super excited to showcase our work, have it in a festival, in a theater. The Bytown is well known and is a place that we all really enjoy uh, for the amazing films that they show there. But um, it's not just about that. For me, it's really an opportunity to go back to the Rideau Bakery, to remember the Rideau Bakery, and to really celebrate what an amazing institution it was and the devotion of the Kardash family and the community that it, it um, you know, that it, that it grew and that it supported. Um, I can't tell you the number of people who I have promoted the, the screening to or spoken about it, uh, the screening with in the last number of weeks who have said to me, oh, I used to go to the bakery all the time. I loved the Rito Bakery and they'd have a story about it. Well, you know, I used to go in there and I went with my mom or I used to always buy their rye bread or, and I've just been really amazed by that kind of feedback by so many different people. Ed and Jane, thank you so much for your time today. Ed and Jane, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thanks, Monique. It was really a pleasure to talk about our film and uh, we really appreciate your interest. Yes, thanks, uh, Monique. I really enjoyed talking to you and I appreciate the questions you were asking uh, and that we could share and talk about our film, Lunch at the Lido.